coming up on Lawmakers. The FY06 budget makes progress. Congressional redistricting gains momentum and a common map. And impassioned debate in the Senate over a bill dealing with eligibility for peach care for kids. Those stories and more are next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers for Friday, February 25th. Here are your anchors, Enwandi Lawson and Gerald Bryant. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, a group of independent ministers gather at the Capitol to call for legislation prohibiting homosexuals from adopting or providing foster care for children. And Speaker of the House Glenn Richardson speaks out against redistricting and in, fa in favor of redistricting and against the smoking ban. But our top story tonight, progress in the FY06 budget. The 2006 budget, House Bill 87, passed out of several subcommittees today, one being the Appropriations General Subcommittee, where a couple of recommendations involved cuts to Governor Sonny Perdue's commission for a new Georgia program. David Zelsky joins us live from the Capitol with the details. David. Well, Wandy, I talked about the budget with House Appropriations Chairman Ben Harbin, who told me this is a process that the House Republican leadership is dealing with for the first time in history and believes it's going well thus far. We've moved portions of it through committees. We have six subcommittees, and uh, four of the subcommittees have met today and moved out their, their budgets uh, to more public safety. And um, let's see, higher education will meet Monday, and they will move their subcommittee proposals out, and then we will put the budget together hopefully next Tuesday and have it ready to go to the full, back to the full committee on Wednesday as a full 06 budget. The governor's House floor leader, Rich Golick, was not happy with a proposed $1 million cut to the implementation of the Commission for a New Georgia. The governor's budget recommendation originally was $3 million to begin centralizing the Department of Human Resources. The breakdown for these costs was spelled out. It was spelled out uh, in previous meetings. And, um, you know, like I said before, these $3 million didn't, you know, the $3 million figure just to come out of the it's, it's been justified and worked on for, for a long time. But the governor respects the will of this committee and, um, and they move forward in the interest of moving forward. The eventual compromise in this subcommittee was $2.5 million for the commission. It's been hard work. It's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of things we've had to learn and pick up on, but we've got great staff and we've got great vice chairs and they have done a wonderful job of, of finding savings and putting together a good budget that I think uh, that we can once again pass overwhelmingly on the House floor. Now, the House and Senate have put aside conference committee talk on the 05 supplemental budget for the time being and have turned most of their concentration on the 06 budget getting through the House. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. Thanks a lot, David. And the state Senate voted today to begin the process of moving the Peach Care for Kids health insurance program under Medicaid. That's part of the Department of Community Health Medicaid reform plan. Here's Senator Tommy Williams. Part of the bill that uh, was a little bit onerous to us we decided to take out was giving over to the department the right to determine eligibility and the poverty level. Uh, my amendment as well as the uh, amendments by my colleagues across the hall are actually uh, giving that, taking that back and keeping it within the legislative uh, branch. Uh, the third part of the bill actually gives a, thir a third party administrator uh, the right to work with the Department of Labor to determine uh, income levels. We, we feel like we have some people that are uh, abusing our programs by saying they're making less than they actually uh, are making and we won't be able to verify that so we're taking care of the least of these and not the most of these. Um, the last section would just uh, uh, amend uh, uh, existing law uh, to, to include uh, members of the Peach Care program in managed care and then we have one section at the end of the bill which allows for program budgeting. Now while Senator Williams agreed with Senator Regina Thomas that Senate Bill 140 needed to be amended so that peach care eligibility requirements remained in the hands of the General Assembly, Senator Thomas strongly opposed moving peach care under Medicaid. Do we ever expect to do what is right in this state and get good results by being mean and hateful to people? I don't think so. We are putting peach care under the same guidelines as Medicaid. The federal poverty level now is 235%. And I understand it may go to 185%. And that's going to eliminate a lot of families from peach care and Medicaid. But you don't care. 
Let me just assure you, there's nothing in this bill that is kicking one single person off the Peach Care program. Not one. We're not changing eligibility. We're not changing the poverty level. We are going to a managed care environment because, folks, we've got to get our hands around the money we're spending. Senate Bill 140 passed 33 to 18, and it moves to the House. Well, the, the two thousand... Also today, the Senate adopted principles of reapportionment. Those are guidelines uh, while drawing new congressional districts. Minority Leader Robert Brown was opposed to the bill. We begin with Senator Chip Rogers, where he explains the reapportionment committee's bill. It simply says that if we're going to take up maps, that they need to comply with the United States Constitution and the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965. Beginning with line seven, all districts need to be composed of a contiguous territory, and that does not include single points. Single point is not contiguity. Number three, all districts shall be compact and bizarre shapes will be avoided. Number four, no district shall divide a community of interest unless necessary to comply with federal standards. A community interest is loosely defined as a variety of factors, including but not limited to economic, social, and cultural factors, government services, and location. Number five, district, districts shall divide as few counties as possible and recognize political boundaries as to be practical to, com to comply with other requirements. And number six, no district shall be established with the intent or effect of diluting the voting strength of any person, group of persons, or members of any political party. Uh, the people of Georgia, I think, have made their peace with this process. They understand who their senators and representatives and Congress people are at this time. Uh, the Congress people are going forward with building their constituency base, moving forward with the issues that are affecting this state. I see no need for us to, at this juncture, for any reason other than maybe has the implicated partisan one uh, about what we are engaging in this process. I would urge that we continue to focus on those needs that are most uh, important to the people of Georgia, education, health care, economic development. Those are the things that we need to be placing our attention on, and I think this is a, a diversion that this body does not need at this time. Senate Resolution 166, outlining principles for reapportionment, passed by a vote of 36 to 16. The congressional reapportionment process is well underway at the state capitol. Both the House and Senate reapportionment committees passed out the same congressional map today. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman joins us live with more. Jesse. And Wandy, as we've seen in previous sessions, redistricting maps can make seatmates into bitter enemies and staffers into amateur cartographers. Earlier today, reapportionment committees in both chambers passed out a map that was generated by the Office of Congressman Lynn Westmoreland. The map's designer presented the new map to the Senate committee this afternoon. Brian Tyson says the maps he drew are not politically driven. The primary goal was the uh, one person, one vote, trying to get all these districts down to absolute zero, plus or minus one person from the ideal population size. Within that, we worked to comply with the Voting Rights Act uh, by not retrogressing in majority minority districts. And then within those two confines, we worked to keep counties whole as much as possible. But Democratic leaders couldn't disagree more. It's clear that Republicans have decided they want to try and enhance their uh, members of the delegation um, as a purely partisan drawn map. The new maps are based on census numbers from the year 2000. Committee Chairman Chip Rogers admits politics played a part in the design, but says it could have been much worse. Certainly politics uh, was a factor, but certainly not the determining factor. Had we wanted to draw a map that... Uh, most likely would have sent more Republicans to Congress, you would not see the map that we came out with today. I mean, clearly we had the opportunity to draw a map that would have had more Republican members, but that's not what we're doing. Minority Leader Robert Brown insists there will be a fight over the maps. There are a lot of options that are going to be available to us. I mean, the, the courts uh, need to review this. The Justice Department needs to review this. Uh, this is not something that we're just going to take laying down. And the House Reapportion Committee passed out the same map early this morning. That was a much shorter meeting. Some committee members said it lasted only a minute. Votes in both committees went right down party lines, so it looks like we're in for another long redistricting battle this year. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Now, Jesse, we heard earlier in the session that redistricting wasn't going to be a Republican priority. So was there any indication about why it's suddenly on the move? Yeah, I talked to uh, Chairman Rogers, and he said that since tort reform and most of the governor's education agenda have already cleared both houses, the leadership decided to ride on the momentum. All right. Thanks a lot, Jesse.
While following the reapportionment meeting, one House Democrat spoke out strongly against the process by which the congressional maps were given a committee due pass. Representative Barbara Reese said that in a meeting that lasted less than two minutes, a map drawn by Republican U.S. congressmen was steamrolled through. This morning, in the reapportionment committee, I saw the most blatant misuse of power that I have ever witnessed. Power from Washington. The meeting was called to order, a new map was laid down, a motion was made, a second was made, the map passed, we were adjourned. I had no chance to even look at the information that accompanies that map. I don't know if it's a good map or a bad map. I still don't know. I'm talking about the process this went through. I am talking about the influence of Washington over this body and the Senate across the hall. I hope that you will stand against outside influence and make sure that decisions made here are made by the members of this House and jointly agreed by with both bodies of this House, not Washington. Thank you. Well, after the House adjourned, House Speaker Glenn Richardson responded to Representative Reese's charges, saying that he stands behind the process by which the maps were drawn and adopted. But I just found it ironic that she would go to the well and criticize because we're letting somebody else do the map, when everybody, including her, knows full well that Roy Barnes drew that other map, and Bobby Kahn. And I didn't hear her criticize that. So I'm not saying we're doing that. In fact, I'm going to say the opposite. The governor is not drawing this map. Congress is not drawing this map. Well, he went on to say that the map had, in fact, been drawn by members of the General Assembly. Richardson told reporters also that during that press conference that while he personally opposes a statewide ban on smoking in public places, he will not attempt to stall the adoption of a statewide smoking ban. We're not going to artificially kill the bill as uh, y'all have alluded to in our efforts to be transparent and bring issues to the floor, even though I philosophically do not like that bill, uh, if it gets through the committee, I, I mean, you, you know this, I could kill it in the Rules Committee. I could just say, no, don't call it. I'm not going to do that. What I really wish would happen is that businesses would put a big sign out at their restaurant that says, warning. We allow people to smoke cigarettes in here. If you don't like it, do not come in this restaurant. Both the House and Senate versions of the statewide smoking ban are currently in the House. Senator Joseph Carter doesn't believe school bus drivers should smoke on the job, but he does approve of quoting the lyrics from children's songs. There's a popular children's song that goes, The wheels on the bus go round and round. The wipers on the bus go swish, swish, swish. This bill would make sure that that song is not amended so that it includes a verse, the driver on the bus goes puff, puff, puff. What this bill does simply is to make sure that the use of smoking tobacco is prohibited in this state. Believe it or not, in the code, a thorough research shows that there's no prohibition against the use of smoking tobacco on school buses, vans, or other vehicles used to transport children to or from school or other educational programs. In this state, approximately 11 percent of Georgia's children ages 0 to 17 have asthma. One in six Georgia households has a child with asthma. Sixty-five percent of the children who have asthma suffered an attack last year, missing some 540,000 days of school. And parents who had to stay home with those children missed some, miss some 390,000 days of work. This bill is supported by the American Lung Association, American Heart Association, uh, the Department of Education. It simply says you cannot use smoking tobacco on a school bus whether there are children there or not. And the Senate approved of Senator Carter's school bus smoking ban. It passed 48 to 1 and it heads to the House. The Senate today passed a bill protecting establishments that board companion animals, such as dogs, cats, and even horses. Senate Bill 111 would make it more difficult to file a nuisance complaint against such facilities. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Senator Greg Grogan said it would also protect pet owners. <coughs> An example of how this would work. 
say the senator from the second has a house on the outside of town and she has this house and in the back we have a fenced in backyard and we have two or three dogs if someone comes in and moves next door some big brother some big government or some developmental authority comes in if the senator has been in that location for a year then this group that's coming in cannot file a nuisance so therefore they're protected. I want you to picture this beautiful spring day. I want you to picture this great, beautiful, blush green backyard. And I want you to picture this beautiful golden retriever. And back there, beside this golden retriever, I want you to picture this beautiful five-year-old girl. She may have on a little sundress, white sandals, bows in her hair, and she's got an arm around this dog. And she's got a smile on her face and she's happy. And if you vote yes today, you're voting for this young lady. Now let me, let me put another picture for you. This dark, rainy, cloudy day in the backyard, the grass is dead. This young, this dog is trembling and this young girl, instead of laughing, has tears in her eyes. And if you vote no on this today, you're voting for this young lady to tell this dog that she, her best friend, that she's got to leave, the dog's got to leave because of a nuisance. Senate Bill 11 passed 50 to 1 and goes to the House. The Senate also passed a bill today allowing you to buy mail-order prescription drugs from Georgia companies. Senator Don Balfour says that's something not available now. This bill basically does one thing and one thing only. Right now, your constituents can order drugs through the mail. They can do it right now. The only thing they can't do is they can't order it from a company who ships drugs from inside the state of Georgia. There are companies that have uh, facilities inside the state of Georgia, and if you're under a health plan that encourages you to get mail-order drugs or get generic drugs, if you're going to have them shipped, you have to have them shipped from Oregon. You have to have them shipped from Pennsylvania. You have to have them shipped from other states. All your, every single one of your constituents today can order drugs through the mail. The only thing they can't do is order them from a company inside the state of Georgia, which is really a, a foolish uh, uh, law that we have on our books an antiquated law that we have on our books. This would, um, this would change it to allow your constituents to, to purchase their drugs from companies inside the state of Georgia. Senate Bill 199 passed 33 to 18 and it goes to the House. And the House voted today to urge Congress to protect the domestic textile industry. Representative Tommy Smith explains House Bill 142. You know, because the Chinese government essentially finances the textile and apparel sector through currency manipulation, central bank loans, subsidy state-owned enterprises, export subsidies, tax incentives, and reduced electrical costs, among many more, Chinese exporters are free to drop prices to whatever level is necessary in order to make a sale. The sole purpose of this resolution is to encourage the Federal Committee on the implementation of textile agreements to approve the American textile industry's China Safeguard petition. House Bill 142 passed by a vote of 148 to 2 and moves to the Senate. The House also approved several housekeeping bills today, including one to bring the employee retirement system in line with federal tax laws. It brings it in compliance with the Internal Revenue Service this is requested by the retirement system in order that we don't lose our tax-exempt status. House Bill 460 passed without opposition, and it moves to the Senate. And a group of Baptist ministries from across Georgia and other southern states called on the General Assembly today to pass laws which would affect the gay and lesbian community. Lawmakers Chris Knight is live with more on that story. Chris. That's right, Gerald. The group wants to have their voices heard on numerous issues, including restricting gays and lesbians from adopting or serving as foster parents. Gay rights organization Georgia Equality says the gay and lesbian community is fed up with these attacks. You can't make something right that's wrong! It's wrong! 
It's wrong! It's wrong! Reverend Franklin Radish, along with a group of Baptist ministries from across Georgia, spoke out against the gay and lesbian community today at the Capitol. The group was here with a message. To call for a national ban against same-sex marriage and civil unions. And the group also called upon the governor and the General Assembly to make some changes on the state level as well. To pass a new adoption law that prohibits uh, uh, sodomite men and women from adopting children here in the state of Georgia or from providing foster care for them. What they're doing is they're sensationalizing an issue to further their own coffers. Chuck Bowen, the executive director of Georgia Equality, says he's tired of the attacks made against the gay and lesbian community. And really, the, the gay and lesbian community in the state of Georgia and other states, we're, we're getting pretty fed up with being treated like this and being used as the catalyst for groups such as these particular people uh, to try to raise money and build support. And, and that's, that's what all this is about, and it's very sad. And Georgia Equality maintains that everyone should be treated the same despite their sexual orientation. Reporting live, I'm Chris Knight for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, Chris. Senator Johnny Isaacson was in Atlanta this week promoting President Bush's Social Security reform plan. While taping Georgia Public Broadcasting's Georgia Week in Review, he told host Susan Hoffman about just what that plan is designed to accomplish. What the president is attempting to do is prevent people by the time they reach the age of 55 and older not being able to take care of themselves. If the president's proposal is embraced and works over time as it will, seniors will have more to buy from AARP than they, than they will if they don't do it. Remind so you, I don't know. Remind viewers right now the three things that the president has promised in his proposal. If you're 55 now mm -hmm. and when the, when the new proposal starts, you're guaranteed. You'll pay your payroll tax as long as you work. You'll receive your benefit as long as you live. You are under 55. You have the personal option, your choice, to self-direct up to 4% of your payroll tax into a personal retirement account. And lastly, no payroll tax increase. You can see Susan Hoffman's complete interview with Senator Isaacson on Georgia Week in Review this Sunday, February 27th at 1 p.m. only on Georgia Public Broadcasting. Well, it was another busy week in the Georgia General Assembly. David Zelsky gives us a look at some of the key legislative issues from the past few days. On Tuesday, the House passed a bill that made some changes to the lottery-funded Hope Scholarship. House Bill 299 would limit the number of credit hours that Hope Scholars are funded to 127. The Senate Education Committee also made some changes dealing with the lottery, removing all capital outlay projects from lottery proceeds. This legislation only cleans up the law so that it's, it's not in statute that we can go back to doing that at some point uh, because I think people want to have the confidence that we're going to use Hope funds for scholarships and grants. Also on Tuesday, members of the Service Employees International Union rallied on the front steps of the Capitol. Today is the day we take back the taxpayer dollar and make sure that it's appropriated the right way. They believe state employees deserve better health benefits and 3% raises in January instead of the proposed 2% increase. On Wednesday, the General Assembly recessed for the first half of the day to honor the life of former Georgia Governor Ernest Vandiver. Former President Jimmy Carter was among the attendees who spoke at the memorial service. Later on Wednesday, both houses reconvened to pass two of Governor Purdue's education bills. The Senate passed Senate Bill 35, which would delay class size reductions for two years in grades 4 through 12. Let's give these school systems the flexibility that they need on deciding how many children should sit in their classrooms. The House then adopted Senate Bill 34, which creates a master level teacher program, allowing opportunities for pay raises. Representative Sue Burmeister's 24-hour abortion waiting period bill passed the House Wednesday. 21 states currently have a waiting period to get an abortion. Five others have passed such legislation. Also on Wednesday, the Senate passed Senate Bill 90, which would ban smoking in many public facilities. Special entertainment districts, however, like Underground Atlanta, would be exempt from the ban. And on Thursday, Senator Sam Zamoripa filed a bill that would split Fulton County into two separate counties, Milton and Atlanta counties. 
Later on Thursday, Senator Jeff Mullis tabled legislation that would keep talks between public officials and members of the private sector confidential during business negotiations. Florida, their confidentiality is uh, in behind closed doors for 10 years. Georgia was just until the negotiations have been done. This bill is like kissing a pig. You can put lipstick on the lips of a pig, but it's still a pig. And I don't think the people of Georgia are, are ready to kiss a pig uh, like this bill. And that's the headlines for this week in the Georgia General Assembly. I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. A resolution renaming the legislative office building near the Capitol after the late United States Senator Paul Coverdell is on its way to Governor Perdue. House Resolution 47 passed the Senate today, and several senators paid tribute to Senator Coverdell. He was an outstanding United States Senator, and uh, he uh, served Georgia well up until uh, just a, a couple of years ago when uh, he was uh, the victim of a brain aneurysm and passed away. So this is a, a resolution meant to honor the former Senator, State Senator Coverdale and U.S. Senator Coverdale for his service, and it would uh, have the effect of renaming the, well, naming the legislative office building in his honor. He cared deeply for both this institution, the state senate and the chambers here, but also the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Congress and the U.S. Senate. He loved uh, his country very deeply, and uh, we miss him very much. But there's one aspect of Paul Coverdale that rings clear to this day and stands out in my mind was one word, and that word was integrity. I think it is most fitting that the legislature honor a man who was a man of principle and high integrity that served as a United States Senator from this state. I wish that the House of Representatives had picked another choice that would fit a little better. Paul, as most of you know, sons of 44th and 33rd now, the only ones that know, they opposed building that building, and uh, they opposed it strongly. House Resolution 47 passed 47 to 3 and goes to the governor. A programming note, lawmakers will not be broadcast Monday or Tuesday because the Georgia General Assembly is not in session. Lawmakers will return with all the latest from under the Gold Dome Wednesday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. And if you've missed any part of this broadcast, tune in when Lawmakers is rebroadcast Monday morning at 5.30 a.m. on GPB. Just a reminder for those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch Lawmakers online. Lawmakers is streamed live and archived on our website every night that we're on the air. Be sure to tune in Sunday at 1 p.m. for Georgia Week in Review. This week, host Susan Hoffman talks with Pulitzer Prize winning author Nick Kotz about his latest book, Judgment Days. The work is about the relationship between President Lyndon Johnson, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. The program will also include an interview with U.S. Senator Johnny Isaacson about President Bush's proposed changes to Social Security. That's Sunday at 1, only on Georgia Public Broadcasting. Now stay tuned for Georgia Business Report. That program program is coming up next here on GPB. And that's our broadcast for this, the 25th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Edwandi Lawson. And I'm Gerald Bryant. For all of us at Lawmakers, good night. Have a great weekend. <laughs> good night. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.